Yes, Morris. Uh, uh, I'd like to know, in, in view of your uh, support, can I speak into the case of Noble here? I'd like to know, in view of your support of the PLO, how you justify uh, supporting the PLO being a terrorist organization as they are. Well, it's a little of what, what I consider the uh, topic of the day, but I'll do my best. Can you hear? Is this thing functioning? It's people outside. I think only outside. Really? It's the remote for the people outside. There's another couple hundred people There's outside. There's no speaker in here. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not going to go outside. Well, do you all want to go outside? <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get my balance here. I didn't expect a question like that. My, uh, I don't support the PLO and never have. I support what I consider the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. And uh, that uh, should be taken at face value. I don't support killing by any side in that conflict or any other as a means of solving human troubles. So can't, you can't kill in this one. You know, so like, let me sort of get this, and you talk to them, and it'll come through here. Okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought I was doing. Can people hear? Yeah. That's the best I can do. If you can't hear, come up front. You will hear. What else is on people's minds? Yeah, right. So I was very moved by your talk, Right. For those right. I think it needs to be uh, mentioned again and again that these are public men in public positions and that they're accountable for what they're doing. Very good. No, I, I don't have any quarrel with that. I think that uh, I've been helped in all of this by that great essay of Thomas Merton, which he called The Sanity of Eichmann, and which should be read by every thinking person in the world because he says it would be so comforting to all of us if we could conclude rightly that Eichmann was insane. The fact is, he was stone sane and so held by the court and so convicted as someone, as you said, someone responsible for his crimes. I think when we use the word insanity to try to grope toward an understanding of what goes on today, we, the, the questioner is entirely correct. It's an ambiguous term and is not meant and should not be used as though it meant that these people were not to be held accountable for actual crimes and for preparation of crimes. And I, I'm glad the question arose. It's a very important one. I think that, <laughs> you know, uh, someone like Dr. Caldicott, for instance, uses the word insanity, and she's a medical person, as you know, in regard to leadership that would undertake such projects with a covering language that evidently, at least in their minds, and in the minds of thoughtless people, legitimates the preparation of war crimes. And she can only evidently grab that situation by using the word insanity. But I, again, I think that we have to plow that word up. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this, this lady, right? Uh, if uh, our leaders are insane, uh, that means that they are not uh, cognizant of reality, which I believe also. If that is so, then how can we reach them by any kind of sane uh, approach? My, if I knew that question, we wouldn't have the dilemma. <laughs> the answer to that question, I don't know. I, I think we can only draw in our own lifetime on our Vietnam experience, in which we made that hideous adventure first of all, unwinnable 
and then unwageable and remove two presidents who thought that they could do either or both. And that's a very heartening thing because it, it, it has been evidently shown that both Johnson and Nixon were ready to introduce nuclear weaponry into the conflict. They couldn't quite do it. Um, when I was in North Vietnam in 70, it was quite clear that Johnson had introduced tactical nuclear weapons into Vietnam. So were the tacticians there to set them off, and they never were set off. Uh, Ellsberg has documented the fact that Nixon, through Kissinger, threatened the Vietnamese repeatedly at the Paris peace talks with nuclear weapons unless they came to heel. I came to realize that maybe we're back trying to understand that word insanity. There was no ethical limit to what these characters were willing to do. The only limitation on them was their political survival. And it was only our people and the Vietnamese that called that in question. And thereby excluded, or kept nuclear weapons out of that conflict. But there is, uh, maybe that's the, uh, what we mean by insanity. There's no moral limit to what they're willing to do. There is only the limiting factor of what they can get away with. And that depends on us. I submit. Yeah. Say that the Vietnam War stopped because it was not profitable. Uh -huh. They ran out of the weapons that they were trying to test and use, and you know that there were other reasons why it ended. It wasn't. And it wasn't. And it wasn't because of the cost. Well, let's say that uh, a sum of a lot of factors made their own political survival questionable, and so the war ended. I, I, I think you know we could get complicated about it, but. The American people were certainly involved in the fact that that war did not develop into a nuclear war. I, I think uh, the, uh, the Ellsberg insists upon that in the Pentagon Papers. Anyway, yeah, right. Uh, how do you face the general proliferation of nuclear weapons? The fact that Pakistan is working on nuclear weapons, the fact that Gaddafi would love to purchase nuclear weapons, and in a sense, it's a kind of a runaway course at this point. Uh, and also the problem of nuclear weapons behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. Is, is it possible in any way to form a link-up of peace groups in, you know, on a worldwide basis? Because uh, we, we are a ma the major force, or, yeah. or a major force, but the thing has already escaped out of bounds at this point. It's well, <laughs> I think, again, the, you know, a conclusion like that, it's out of bounds, is certainly a, a great temptation. I think, again, where are the bounds coming from? Right now they're coming primarily from Europeans. They must also come from us. They must come from everywhere, obviously. <coughs> everywhere. And in many parts of the world we know that people are paying much more heavily for saying no to this than we are. So we should be mindful of those resistors elsewhere. Um, I don't know what else to say. I, I don't think that we should be hopeless. I, I felt less hope a year ago than I do now. I think something very powerful is gathering. And that in Europe, the nuclear arms question is going to topple political leadership in several countries that will not agree to, to, to kick them out. I suppose you read the platform of the Labour Party in England. They want everything out of England. And I think Mrs. Thatcher is going down. And I think we're going to see something very good there. Anyway, so it goes. So, uh, you know, if we were standing around, sitting around a year ago, I would perhaps uh, pass the weeping towel to you and back and forth. But now I won't do it. Yes, ma'am, right. Do you have any views on the development of outer space laboratories? It's another chilling development, obviously. Terrible, terrible. You probably know of this famous Riverside Research Institute in New York where many of us have been arrested repeatedly and their goodie now, which they're preparing and for you, me, and the children, 
is laser beam warfare. So uh, come on out and be arrested with us, please. Back row, they're young. It's obvious that people like Flash are needed to to voice the problem. And I wonder if you ever experienced any conflict knowing that your actions will lead to incarceration. And if you have, a morally it's something that has to be done. But is there any feeling that that somehow the power that could be activated like by the computer is kind of like is less than, than incarceration? Well, I don't know how to weigh these things. I, I think those are always tough questions. But let's just say that the power generated by my being here this morning is precisely because we've been in and out of jail. You know? And at some point, I, I think talk has to lead beyond talk. I don't know. Uh, we have questioned one another a great deal for years on this whole thing. The idea that four are now staying in jail when they could be out on minimal bond is another little footnote to the question. And when, when they come to give their reasons for staying in, they put it something like this. We want to send a message to, to the peace movement that it's a serious situation and prison is a good place to send a serious message. And from which to be taken seriously. Well, so some are in, some are out. Yes, in. Yeah. Uh what is uh, you, what's in the story with the media? I mean, you know, you've got minimal coverage <laughs> on this thing out there. And uh, and I don't know, was anybody here this morning? And, you know, like, uh, what are we going to do about that? Well, I don't know. We, we sort of get a little bit detached from the media because they're so detached from us. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, there, around the trial, there was some willingness in the mainline media to take the whole thing uh, seriously. And uh, in most instances, that, was, that decision was cut off at the top. Uh, and I could give examples of that. Life magazine, 60 Minutes... The New York Times, especially the Sunday Magazine, they were going to do a big thing, and it was all those decisions were turned back, and uh, it was quite clear that at some high level they were they were determined to ignore us, and at that point you just go on without them. So what? The word gets around. Can I throw some light on that question? Sure. Because, uh, I was handling the business of media for this meeting, among other things, and I had personal conversations with three. New Jersey desk men covering NBC, CBS, and ABC. Right. They all said yes, I'll be here. <laughs> Not one show. Right. It was very strange because I called them more than once. I sent confirming letters, right. and they gave me assurance. Suddenly, it's quiet. It's interesting. Right. Hey, Dave. Well, the people who are outside were not hearing what's going on on the floor. Could you tend to repeat some of it? So okay, we will do. Yeah, well, can we just hear from someone we haven't heard from? Yes, sir, right. As an American, with a representative government where the majority elects the people we would trust to lead us, isn't it conceivable that this minuscule group may be on the wrong track and those who are bearing the burden of leadership understand everything that you do and are doing what is necessary under the circumstances. If I had been in command of the decision for the bomb at Hiroshima, I would have ordered it dropped because we planned on a million American casualties. It was a painful decision, not taken lightly by perfectly compassionate people and I think we ought to pray for ourselves and them that maybe they've got a tougher job than you're giving them credit for. Well, thank you. Anyway. Well, I thought that that was much more a comment than a question. I'm not sure whether we it want to pursue comment, that. Yeah. Do we have sure. the right to claim they're insane right and this more body all well, I think, again, the experience under Hitler gives us some light about people who enter a scene of public authority legally and then betray their office. So the idea that this guy is in office doesn't suffocate my conscience 
with regard to his crimes. Right. No, wait a minute. We, we want to hear from the Right here. Okay. I, I just wanted to say for the taking notes and tape recording everything, uh, you said less hopeful. You, were, you mean that you were more hopeful? More hopeful. Correct the tape. <laughs> 18 minutes of silence. Well, let's erase the tape. <laughs> Not in this place. In honor of another legally elected crook. <laughs> uh, would your film uh, to educate the public, the recent film you made, will that be on TV or just uh, by request from different organizations? The question is about the film that was made, you see? Uh, all of us eight feel very good because now we know we exist. We're on film. Um, the film is as yet unfinished. It will be finished, as far as we know, around the new year. Um, it's already been sold across Europe. It hasn't been sold in America. Another example of uh, ethical retardation. <laughs> yes. I was uh, active in some civil disobedience at Rocky Flats in Colorado. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. And uh, the thing that struck me particularly about the actions there was that uh, the state police that arrested us, the personnel in the jail by and large, uh, all were quite respectful of us in contrast to experiences I'd had ten years before. Uh, I've read about Pantex in Amarillo and I understand that that's not the case, that there's a population that's pretty hostile to the anti-nuclear movement. I was wondering what your experience was in uh, Pennsylvania with the police and with locals. Uh, the question had to do with the experience of a young person here who was in uh, in uh, trouble for resisting nukes in uh, Rocky Flats and uh, was treated quite well by the authorities. And what went on here in that regard? How were we treated? Is that okay? Yeah. Well, um, I always thought that the judge, our judge, had been airlifted from Mississippi in 1954. <laughs> It took him a long time to reach the north, and he had gotten no news since he took off. <laughs> he also was colorblind, and we must have looked black. <laughs> so that, that's about Judge Salas. Salas, by the way, is a Latin word, as I reminded him during the trial, meaning salvation. <laughs> so he proceeded to save us. You know, it was a little bit like the uh, official in Vietnam who said we had to destroy them to save them. Anyway, uh, well, that whole county is uh, a big chunk of Mississippi. That's because GE runs the county. And if you are making nukes for your living, you have to have fascism in the courts and in the jails, and that's what they have. Once we got into the state prisons, it was very different as far as the prisoners were concerned. I found more political understanding among lifers than I find on the streets of New York. And I don't say that romantically. I don't like what lifers ordinarily are in there for. But they certainly knew what we were in there for, and that was interesting. My stint in the state prisons was very brief up to now, but my impression was that whatever inhumanity was in the air was being ordered from above, from the political leadership of the state. The, the guards and all were very nice people, at least as far as we were concerned. Uh, but they have been extremely uneasy about all of us, and Philip was again shifted uh, to a much more remote prison just a week ago. They, they don't know where to put people like that, so they keep, uh, keep them on the road, because they work too well with prisoners. Things like that. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay? Sure. Yes, yeah, sure. I noticed when you responded to the, to the gentleman that, uh, I mean, if it had been me, I would have said, well, you can excuse the one on Hiroshima, but what about testing another one on Nagasaki and yeah. dropping the plutonium? And thereby, kind of estranging one person from the rest of the climate in the room. And I find myself doing that. Is it purposeful that you very softly uh, express very little and went on to the next question? Is well, that, that I, a way to 
I'm just trying to judge, you know, what will be useful for our meeting here, and I, uh, I mean, there's so many things to be said about dropping a nuclear weapon anywhere. There's so much solid evidence that we never needed to do it. It was an exemplary bomb to show Russia we had it. I mean, that's come out in documents. It had nothing to do with saving American lives. But I, I just, you know, it's, I, I, it's so horrible and so passe that I didn't want to linger on it, really. Uh, I'd like to add something to that. You. Yeah. There is a body of evidence which says that the same effect could have been had by dropping that yeah. bomb on an empty, on a yeah. deserted island to show of course. that we had it and what it could do, and perhaps that might have not only saved the million American lives, but it would have saved the million Japanese lives at the same time. Right. Thank you. I want you to notice, by the way, that I have on my feet the only gift I've ever received from the state. It's a pair of shoes made by prisoners. And uh, they, they have flat irons for soles. They weigh about 10 pounds, so you can't get over the wall. <laughs> and my shirt was made by a prisoner, a woman who went over the uh, Trident fence in Washington, got 30 days, and made me a shirt. And, uh, head to toe, I'm a, an example of law-abiding or something. In recent months, a number of Catholic bishops may have made rather good statements on peace issues. Admittedly, for the most part, they're not the bishops of the largest dioceses and so forth. Is this one of the signs of hope that you see, and can you help it along? Well, I uh, have been just delighted with that development, you know, and it started, really, a lot of that change, I think, started around our trial for the first time in my life. A bishop showed up to say something about the fact that we were not renegades. And... Um, uh, the, the fact, especially, that the bishop in, in that town, Amarillo, where the Catholics are in a great minority, would speak up so courageously, and then that all the bishops of Texas would join him. I, I just was boggled by that, you know. I wrote to those bishops, all of them, and thanked them, and said, I hope they remembered that their courage was awakened, because be years ago, and through the last five years at least, uh, people have been dragged away from Pantex and from the Trident base, arrested and given hideous sentences to create an atmosphere in which a bishop could speak up. I said, please don't forget what prepared your courage. I haven't heard from them. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably busy. <laughs> yeah, right. No, well, okay. Right. Come on. He's first. He's first. Okay. Uh, the social service uh, providers, uh, people who've um, helped with the handicapped, people who've helped with uh, the mentally ill, and people who have um, fought for civil rights and other activities, have uh, recently been getting together uh, in congresses and other activities, and there's a lot of energy there, I've noticed, because uh, of the Reagan cutbacks, they have to work together more closely, and they're trying to to work out alternative uh, financing, alternative ways to continue their activities. And I was wondering if uh, you have, uh, or others in the peace movement, have been able to connect with this sort of activity uh, since there seems to be a connection between the two. The money for social services is going down, sure. the money for military yeah. is going up. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you have, uh, if this has happened. Well, uh, the question is whether we're connecting with people that are concerned about the Reagan cutbacks. Uh, I don't think we've been able, really, to just don't have the time to make the connections that I believe both sides know are there. I mean, they're there whether we're aware of it or not. Uh, there isn't enough world for the people and the military rat hole. And uh, we keep pounding the world down the rat hole. And the people be damned. I, I, all those connections, it seems to me, are getting more explicit every day. And, and certainly in contesting uh, nuclear weapons, we are pleading for the poor, and whenever we can, we make that explicit, as I tried to this morning, you know. I have never accepted this, uh, what they call, economics of, of, of spiritual doldrums that says the people are the problem. You know, as though, you know, let's get rid of the poor, let's push them down the cracks, then we'll have the kind of world we want, you know, and we'll have enough world for bombs because the people are in the way of the bombs. That really is the implication of a lot of these idiots at the top and their advisors on campuses. If we get rid of the people, then we can really have a good world. Well, 
<laughs> Maybe the pandas will make it. <laughs> right. So I, I think there's a, you know, there's a mutual understanding that we're all in the same struggle. I've never, never felt there was any conflict at all like that, you know. Could I just say this though, because I, I suppose many in the room are church connected, and I felt for a long time that Reagan. I feel a little bit less betrayed under Reagan than I did under Carter. I, I was always working my way through Carter's religious smog, trying to find out who was there. And uh, at least Reagan is, you know, a very good, solid, savage. <laughs> you know who's there. You know who's there. You know? Sometimes the, the, the Carter situation was so foggy that I thought he was just part of the fog. <laughs> Kept looking for him. And only found him on Sunday mornings. Anyway, um, see, I feel that, that the churches yelling now about Reagan are in a certain kind of bad faith. I get very uncomfortable about... Uh, I've been with these leaders of various social agencies in the churches, and they're all joining the big cry about Reagan. We've had a long history, and I'll speak of my own church, of, of, of handing over our poor people to the government instead of taking our own responsibilities for them, with them, you know. And we've just had the idea that there ought to be a kind of a maxi church run by the state in which conscience operates for us out there, and we can go along in the middle class while the government takes care of the street people and all those people we're very uncomfortable about. And suddenly Reagan says, no, it's all over, you know. And what it highlights to me is this very, very long kind of, what to call it, betrayal of the evidence we have in the New Testament that the early communities took care of the poor, you know. And I keep recurring back to Dorothy Day and her understanding of all this. She used to speak with a certain scorn of Holy Mother State. And that puts what I'm trying to say in one phrase, you know. It's Holy Mother Church giving over to the state being Holy Mother, if you see what I mean. And that's a very unholy arrangement, and it's not very mother, to say the least. Anyway. Yeah, right. You know, care at all about the nuclear arms race because they know that after it's over they're going to be saved because they're the first. Go straight up. Or, right. uh, <laughs> Which they will indeed, yeah. Why can't um, religious people such as yourself um, demand equal time on the <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a very good question. But I. Uh, See, we don't, we don't really have that holy income that was paid. <laughs> Maybe with, you know, with a thousand bucks this morning, I can run into a TV studio and get three seconds or something. Make a quick sign of the cross. <laughs> but it takes a lot of money to, uh, you know, go on like that. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not convinced, you know, that that's the best way to do it anyway. I like to be here. I don't like to be on camera. I like to be with the people. I, I figure, you know, to be sandwiched with a serious message between uh, a beer ad and a car ad is not my idea of living. Do you see any alternative to being punished for breaking the law other than changing the law, bearing in mind who makes the law? Hmm. Well, well. <laughs> Let me try that slowly now. <laughs> well, I got the feeling that you felt that what you were doing was just and right. Uh -huh. And legal. And legal. Right. Except the law doesn't see it as legal, and I have a feeling that the Klansmen down south feel the same way about what they're doing. Uh -huh. Now, can we justify them on, under the same umbrella as we justify you? Well, your question is a very good and very serious one. I. Uh, See, the trouble, my, our trouble, let me try to speak for the eight, is simply that the law is not being obeyed by the authorities elected or appointed to uphold the law. The law isn't what condemned us. The judge condemned us. And the judge condemned us, from our way of thinking, illegally. 
because, and I want to be strict about this, he refused to admit the law of the land into that courtroom. What was that law of the land? It was international law ratified by the Congress, which prohibits the preparation of war crimes. That's an illegal conviction. Now, I, I can't speak about the mentality of the Klan. If the Klan wants to justify what it's doing, let it go to court, let it get the public forum going, let it get the media going, and let it argue its case, and let it take the heat, or let it take the release. I, I don't think that there's anything to be done immediately about unjust laws or just laws wrongly applied except to get into a courtroom and, and, and swallow hard and hope for the best and let the Klan do it, which it normally doesn't do. But I mean, I think, see, our conduct is really, you know, from one point of view, it's a terrific act of faith in our fellow and sister people, you know. And we have, I would say, over a long period of criminality, I have never been seriously disappointed in our juries, even when there was the most atrocious attempt to hang us and to prevent us from getting a thoughtful jury, as occurred in Norristown. Those people were railroaded onto that jury, and we were not allowed to question their police connections, their GE connections, their military connections. All of them had them, one way or another. And they threw out nine charges relative to violence brought by GE officials and police swearing and lying under oath, they tossed them out. They believed us when we said these things hadn't occurred. And that was a, not an ideal jury by any means, you know. Well, anyway, things like that. I, I don't know. We've always said, if you're going to do these things, you take the heat and you go to court. And then the people decide. And uh, it's all part of a long process. You can't bring this change overnight. But I w I'm just back from North Carolina for the widows of the five people murdered by the Klan in 79. As you remember, they not only murdered them in cold blood, they did it with collusion of the FBI and the state and city police, and they were all acquitted. And they're still walking around with their guns. And uh, that's a little bit different conduct than we've been into, if you see my point. Yeah, right. You want to spell out that difference of basic difference of violence and non-violence. Well, thank you. Yeah, I would think so. Sure. Uh, the termination of the war, Vietnam War, I think was uh, very clear of the sentiment that was developed among the people of all ages. And uh, the kind of demonstrations that we had, I think, was a tremendous effect upon determination. Now, uh, on the question of the, the bombs that uh, we can propose, which, uh, of course, means a very definite uh, attempt upon the, uh, on a part of the military, the big corporations, and, of course, weakening the South in the, in the straight. What the possibility to develop a real coalition among the people that will be able to bring upon the necessary pressure to stop these deadly weapons that they try to create. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think our possibility exists in the measure in which we say it's possible. <laughs> it, it begins in places like this room. It doesn't begin out there or in church begins when people begin to gather and sweat through this stuff and say we're going to do something. I think. Could I say this too? Uh, I think it's been implied all, all morning, but part of our uh, pondering and praying together when we came up toward this action a year ago, a lot of <coughs> thought that emerged in common about going ahead was that none of the eight saw our fate as the issue. I think we were all about as well prepared as people can be these days for the heat that came down. We were hoping that people would say, the plowshares aid is not the issue, the issue is the issue. And locking up the plowshares aid is not going to dispose of the issue. <laughs> the children are not going to be safer because these eight are behind bars, you know what I mean? And we were hoping that people would take a look, as we tried to, 
at the centers of genocide near where they live and would walk there and picket there and leaflet there and vigil there and break the law there. And it's happened up to a degree in, in some places, but it's got to happen in more of these places. Got to make them inoperable. <coughs> Is your case on appeal? Yeah, it's on appeal now. And the only reason we went really ahead with an appeal was, uh, well, it's an opportunity to get into the record for future usefulness the issues that were denied at the trial. You know, and that becomes part of an important record that can be referred to in the future. And uh, it doesn't close these issues with this judge, and that's very important. Also, my fervent hope is that the appeal somewhere along the line will remove that judge uh, it, uh, because he's constantly screwing poor people down there and the jails are overflowing with his victims. And uh, he, sh he should, I, I don't know how to say it, it doesn't say what he is by saying he shouldn't be on the bench, he shouldn't hold any spot of responsibility for anyone. He, he should be given uh, getting some treatments of some mysterious nature. <laughs> you know, he refused Molly Rush uh, permission to bring her uh, 12 and 14 year old sons into the courtroom to witness their mother's uh, struggle. And we spent days with the Superior Court trying to get Molly Rush's two children to see their mother on trial. And then when he came to sentence us, he brought in his two children, who were half their age, to witness the hanging. This is the kind of mentality in this guy. Anyway. Yeah, right. Uh, this is not a question, but a comment. Yeah. I just, uh, last weekend, was in Washington at the Ralph Nader <coughs> Conference on taking charge, people taking charge of their own resources. And one of the resources they talked about was the media. Uh, and if, uh, there are a lot of articulate people here with a lot of information and ideas. And if you live in a community where there is cable television, cable television by contract with communities is supposed to give community time. And you are entitled to go on cable television and speak about any issue that's important to you. Or if you live in a community where they're now negotiating for cable television, you can go to a, a hearing of that uh, arrangement and ask for community time. So I think this is a, a very important uh, crack that we ought to be taking advantage of, and I just wanted to share it with you. Thank you. Okay. Someone back there? No. Right here. Yeah. What did you actually do at the GE? What did we do at the GE clinic? Okay. I love to go over there and recommend it. Well, we knew from the help that was given us by a, uh, a very high-level engineer, not in that company or that factory, um, a man who resigned from a highly qualified and highly high-security job about two years ago, uh, and was able to advise us that uh, as to the details of the Mark 12A missile. We knew because GE publishes a uh, handbook about the fact that they're making a missile, but we wanted some details. Well, just very briefly, it, it appeared that this Mark 12A is, along with the neutron bomb, probably the most atrocious example of first strike intent, first strike nuclear intent. You see, the weapon uh, evidently can traverse, uh, whether beginning from a, an MX or beginning from a, uh, from a um, Trident submarine, uh, can traverse uh, up to 6,500 miles and land within 20 feet of its target. Therefore, it's not a generalized weapon against the city. You see, it's, it's, meant, to, it's meant to come down on the bunkers or the nuclear um, storage centers of the enemy before, before those things are emptied by the enemy. So it's a first strike weapon. It only makes sense in the event that it is used first. Well, uh, armed, um, or should I say disarmed with that knowledge, um, we decided that we were, we also knew this, that the, the um, so-called re-entry re vehicle, uh, which is the nuclear casing of the whole thing, was being made there at GE, and that it, it's not a metal thing at all, it's a highly heat-resistant ceramic. 
It's meant to withstand the heat of re-entry, the enormous heat of re-entry into the atmosphere. And therefore, it would be highly vulnerable before little household tools. <laughs> well, our eyes lit up at that. And then we devised the symbolism of blood, which we use very often, and the symbolism of hammers, which are a very old biblical tool for making the world right. And went in there without any really high hopes of reaching these things. We didn't know where they were in the plant, and obviously there wasn't anyone around to direct us. <laughs> the guides were ever on another shift. We went in at the changing of the shift in the early morning and found the... We knew the guards were unarmed, that was reassuring. We didn't know how lazy and careless they were, that was more reassuring. <laughs> the, the, there was one guard at the door, and he was, as I recall, reading a local rag as we went by. And two of us engaged him in conversation, the others slipped in. It wasn't a break-in at all, the door was open. It was a walk-in. <laughs> we were thinking later, what a, you know, how easy it would be for really violent people to wreak all sorts of habit with that so-called secure, high security plan. Well, within three minutes, and again, I'm on the front page, not the editorial page, within three minutes, we were there and found them. And uh, there was even a kind of holy bonus around because they had left carelessly exposed all sorts of blueprints, highly classified blueprints for new weapons. And we were able to wreak some havoc and. Uh, rip them all up and stain them with blood and crack open two of these horrible nuclear weapons. And then just stood around and laid all the stuff in the middle and started to say a few prayers while they appalled guards and FBI and police of all denominations arose or appeared or entered. And uh, so we were carted off. Well, it was a really astonishing thing. and, and uh, you know, we're just very proud of it. It's the first act of nuclear disarmament in 35 years. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. You know, could I could I just say this though that uh, I would I suppose most people in this room have never seen a nuclear weapon. I have seen a couple. But up to the trial, I think everyone in the courtroom had never seen one. We never see our own fate, you know? And they had to haul those things into the courtroom as evidence, and there they were, you know? This evidence of, not of our crime, this evidence of official criminality um, and of ideology uh, and willingness to initiate the end of the world. This, if that happens, this will be the instrument. So we could read a lot of things in that mirror. And um, we were very happy that at least some people saw what's coming down, you know. And not to say that the judge was appalled, but I think the jury was rendered more thoughtful by the sight of those things, because we were constantly appealing to the fact of children and so on. Yeah, right. Dad, could you tell us some other companies other than GE that you know are involved in this so we might be aware of what company they're doing? Well, there's a terrific list of them. They're all making a lot of money on these things. I don't have it with me, but these... Huh? Very good. The War Resisters League has the all the list of these chief war contractors, and everybody should have that right next to the telephone directory. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'd like to make a comment on the argument that the Hiroshima bomb saved a million American lives. Now, I read an article in 1948 in Look magazine by an admiral, or rear admiral, Ellis Zacharias, C-A-C-H. And he was, he was deputy chief of naval intelligence in the Pacific. And according to this article, Japan had already put out three lists for surrender, both through the Vatican and in Sweden. So there was no real need to use the bomb, not even a, a test demonstration, as this gentleman suggested. And uh, people might be interested in, even though this article was written over 30 years ago, it could still be 
use this, this evidence today to counter this, this uh, argument that the bombs saved so many American lives. Thank you. It's all I want to sure. It's a common, not a question. Right. I admire anyone who cares about others. And I'm wondering if the Russians had never gotten the bomb, whether these developments would have continued at the pace at which they have. Mm. And what are we doing to discourage the Russians from doing what our country is doing? Yeah. I think it's as important that they be influenced as our group. And then you frighten us with the thought that there won't be any people around. In my lifetime, the population of the earth has tripled. And places that were accustomed to famine now have fairly well-fed people. So are you unnecessarily alarmist? Our gas was not used in this uh, in World War II. There was plenty of it around. Well, thank you. I, I really wish I were unnecessarily alarmed, and I wish I could be calmed by your opposite views. I, I would be very happy to go back to normalcy if the world were normal. Um, but I'm haunted by the f many facts. The fact that we're the only nation in the world that used it. The fact that we have repeatedly said we would do it again. 